Hi. In this video, I would like to talk about incremental training. It's a technique that we've recently made available inside of Raza, but it's also a technique that's useful in general if you're working on a model more interactively as you're adding new batches of new labels. The idea is like this. You start with a data set, and let's say this is a intent and entity classification case. We've got texts and labels here. Then typically what you would do is you would take this data set and you would turn it into a machine learning model. You would be training on your data, so to say. But the downside of this training procedure is that it's typically rather time intensive, especially as your data set gets bigger and bigger. And if you're working interactively with your data set, then you might wonder, well, if I get a new slice of data here, let's call this slice A, and this would again represent new entities and new intents with labels, then you can wonder, well, do I really need to take this entire data set again to construct my new model? Or can I do something here that saves me a little bit of time? Because after all, I already have a model here that should have some knowledge about the data set at hand, and we might be able to use that as a starting point to get to a new model. And in doing so, maybe the training time that we're applying here can be decreased. So the idea would be not to create a new model from scratch, but instead to say, well, we're going to make a new model below here, and we're going to be using the weights that we learned before. In that sense, we could regard this model over here as a pre-trained model. And this can be more of a fine-tuned model in the sense that this is the model that will also see slice A. The next question is how do we actually go about learning from this new data set? And there's a few ways of doing it, but the thing that you wouldn't want to do is only look at this data set here to train the weights you would need here. This is something you wouldn't want to do for two reasons. The first reason is that it's impractical because of the accounting you would have to do on top. Suddenly, for every label, you would also have to track whether or not the data point was in this set A or in this original data set over here. And that extra accounting is going to be a mental burden. Moreover, though, we are also at risk of forgetting. If we only look at this new data set A, we can still take these pre-trained weights as a starting point but we would be risking maybe forgetting all the lessons that were learned in this big data set up here. And that's something we would never want to have happen. We want to learn from this new data set A, but we don't want to forget any of the useful lessons we've learned beforehand. So that means that we can't zoom in on just this new data set. Our training procedure will do something different. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the entire set of data collected so far, and then we're going to say, well, let's just use that for training. But we're only going to be using, let's say, 20% of the epochs that we used beforehand. Exact same training procedure, but we're just going to add this new data set and train for less long. The idea here is that we should have already learned very important things in our previous model above over here. And if we only include some new labels, well... Maybe there's no need to start from scratch, and we can still get this hike in accuracy that we're interested in. And therefore, we might not need to use the same number of epochs. And this will save a whole lot of training time as we add new labels. And what's really nice about this is that we can totally repeat this. If we get this new slice B, again, we can have a look at the entire data set. Again, we can use it to train a new model. But again, we can make do with less epochs. What I hope you recognize at this phase is that by checkpointing our model at different places in time, we are able to make improvements without the need to retrain on this entire data set. You might wonder though, if I were to take this incremental training approach and compare that to training on the entire data set, do I maybe trade off a little bit of accuracy for less training time? And that's a valid question, but we've ran some benchmarks and it definitely seems to be a valid trade-off. I will share some benchmarks at the end of this video, 
But before getting there, I want to talk about this one extra thing to be aware of. Because so far, we have been talking about this model and that we're incrementally updating it. And that's great, but it's not just the model weights that we have to keep in mind here. We also need to think about the features that go into the model, because those will also be perhaps changing as we add new labels. So let's talk about how that works. So let's now think about what this model is that we're actually updating. In Raza, we typically use the diet model, which is, in essence, a neural network with a lot of features and properties that we like. But to keep things simple, let's just regard it as a neural network of sorts. There are features going in, and there are some labels that we're predicting on the outside. Inside, we've got these layers that contain these weights that we will be updating. But if we're going to be updating these weights with new examples and new labels, we shouldn't just consider these weights, we should also consider what happens before. Because we start out with text, which in turn is turned into tokens, and then these tokens are used to generate sparse features as well as dense features. And if you look at the situation this way, then I hope that you can observe that we actually have some requirements for these features that are going in. Namely, we're interested in updating these weights. And that means that we can change the values that are in these layers, but we don't want to replace them altogether, and we also therefore don't want the shape of these layers to change. And if we don't want the shape to change, then for starters, the new dataset that we receive cannot add any labels, because if we do that, we would have to change the shape of the layer here. But the same thing also holds for the features that we have below here. And this is not so much a concern for our dense features, because these are typically pre-trained word vectors or language models. And these typically output a fixed vector, let's say of size 300. So even if a sentence is longer or shorter, this dense representation will always be pulled down to a vector of constant size. But that's not the case for these sparse features. The most typical sparse featureizer that we have is the count vectorizer. And what the count vectorizer does, let's say I have the word hello, then the count vectorizer will take that word and it will map it to an index in an array. It is a sparse array because most of the values inside of this array are going to be zero, but there will be one single one over here because the index that we have for that one corresponds with this token that we have in our count vectorizer. Now, the thing is that this count vectorizer is constructed in the beginning when we're doing our first training sequence. And the size of this count vectorizer will depend on our vocabulary in our training data. Every single word will be mapped onto this array, but the array itself will have a fixed size. So if we see a new word after we've done the training, then the unfortunate effect will be that none of the indices that we have at our disposal can be mapped to this new word. And unfortunately, that would mean that if we were doing this incremental updating, that our count vectorizer might not be able to update, which means that our model might not be able to learn from new words. And that's something that we do not want. So if we're doing this incremental training, we should also consider these sparse features. We have to do something clever with those. So here's a way to deal with that. Let's say that we start with this vector that we construct during training. It's a sparse representation, and let's say that we have 3,000 words in our original training data set, and therefore the size of this sparse vector will be 3,000. What we could do is we could say, well, let's allocate some extra space onto that sparse representation. We have the space for our original data, but we are going to introduce this wiggle room that we are going to attach. The idea is that this wiggle room, when we see our first 
training data will just contain zeros. We're not going to do anything specific. But then if during incremental training we see new words, then we do have a couple of these indices available where we might be able to allocate a one if we see a new word. And by doing this trick, we now have a way to declare sparse featureizers while still being able to learn as we see new words appear. And note that it's the count vectorizer that's able to do this, but also the regex featureizer. For both of these, you will need to say upfront that you want to have a little bit of wiggle room for the interactive updating scenario. And by doing that, we guarantee that we don't have to change the shape of this model over here. The whole point of this interactive scenario is that we are going to limit ourselves to updating these weights because that is allowing us to save a whole bunch of training time. If we were to change all the hyperparameters to this model, then also the interactive training wouldn't work. The goal here is to save time as we're updating, not necessarily to do a giant grid search. Having said all this though, if we make sure that we handle our sparse features the right way, we do now have a procedure that might save us a whole lot of training time. And that's a welcome feature if you're interactively updating your model with new labels. I would like to conclude this video with a small benchmark that we ran on the Raza demo bot, which you can find yourself on GitHub. What we've done is we've taken the training examples in that demo, and we've split it up into part A and part B. There's different examples for intents as well as entities in part A and part B. And what we have done is we've said, well, let's check if we run part A first and then part B, and let's compare that against what happens if we just train on the entire data set from scratch. And it turns out that if you're interested in the F1 score for intents as well as entities, that you really do get results that are somewhat similar. Or at least that's what we saw on this particular benchmark. And you can also see that you save a little bit of time if you take this incremental approach. And I hope that if you are interested in doing more of an interactive way of labeling and updating your model, that being able to update this way will be very convenient because you'll be spending less time waiting and more time iterating on your model.